Dzień dobry. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Ja And the men at the car, Bobby Gules, Kali Mera, Shub Pabi. I have just announced good morning or good day in several languages, including ASL, Polish, Spanish, Tibetan, Aramaic, Armenian, Greek, and Hindi. But what does that have to do with today? Today is Pentecost Sunday. One of the most common stories is of the apostles starting to come out of the upper room, speaking. And the story in Acts says, each heard them in their own tongue. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now why they didn't go running out of the room then, I have no idea. Then, things like flames started landing on everybody's head, and still nobody ran out of the room. And the story goes that there were pious Jews in the area for the celebration from all over the world, and they came to see what was going on because they heard the noise. And as the apostles came out, they were <coughs> speaking in a new language. It was given to them by the Spirit. And what's even more miraculous was everybody there heard what they were saying in their own ear. They understood it. The Spirit came, it landed, and evidently it overflowed. For the apostles, it must have felt like creation all over again, with wind and fire and something new bursting forth. Then there was the amazing linguistic experience of speaking in other languages, yet being understood by people of many different languages and lands, the, the names of which in the gospel have troubled pastors and lectionary readers all for years to come. <laughs> they will continue so. They have a whole litany of all the worlds that it came from. It doesn't really matter though. In that moment, all the people were one in their hearing, if not in their understanding. They were all one in their hearing, and perhaps the deeper meaning of what they heard. Despite their differences, despite language barriers, they could all hear what the disciples were saying, each in their own language. Fire, wind, and humble Galilean speaking persuasively in many tongues were dramatic signs that God was doing a new thing. A new thing that would transform the world for all <coughs> those presents and time on to this day. I'm wondering how confusing and yet miraculous this must have been for not only were the apostles blessed by the Spirit, but all those travelers, all those visitors who heard everything in their own tongue. We know one person said, oh, they must be drunk. Yet how do we each understand them? Today's Gospel reading, that Jesus is foretelling of the coming of the Holy Spirit or the Comforter, or the Advocate. Jesus even says to the ones he loves, it is to your advantage that I must leave. Who at that time must be thinking, really, to my advantage? I'd rather you stay. I don't want you to go. But Jesus explains, if I go, I can then send the Comforter. And when the Comforter arrives, the Comforter will prove the world wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And I think the Spirit is still teaching the world that she is wrong about sin, about judgment, and righteousness. Jesus said when the Spirit of truth comes, the Spirit of truth will guide you to all the truth. Now pay attention, Jesus didn't say right away. Jesus did not say that once the truth is revealed through the Comforter to the humankind, that it will be that we understand it all. Because it's through the Spirit if we could understand it all, if we got it all in that moment, will this world be in the same condition it is in today? 
I mean, if we really understood Jesus' teaching of love, community, open table, would this world be the way it is? Would our human history still be so violent? In the spirit of truth and Christ's love, wouldn't the whole system that puts one above another be gone? There would be no rich or poor, no higher or lower, as it goes on to say, no Greek or Jew, no free or slave. And yet, all that still happens in the world today. For 2,000 years, the Spirit has been guiding us into the truth, and I'm happy to say we've been fighting it and kicking and screaming all along the way. And when I say we, I mean all of humanity, not just the Christian movement. This week there was an article written by our conference minister, and she asks, what would it feel like for us to put ourselves in the shoes of another person? What if we spent more time envisioning what it would be like if we were the ones experiencing injustice, abuse, bullying, and oppression? She says, I, she read an article this past Tuesday that was on the 70th anniversary of the Nakba. Nakba means catastrophe in Arabic, and it refers to the day that 700,000 Palestinians fled or were expelled from their homes in 1948 during the Palestine War. The author of the article, Kathleen Alder, is a member of the United Church of Christ Palestine in the Israel Network. Pin for short, and lives in Oregon. Her What If article asked us to imagine what it would be like if the state of Oregon was suddenly designated as the place for hundreds of thousands of persons in trouble in Europe to come to live, and what if those already living there were forced out of their homes as a result? She goes on to paint a picture of what if the Palestinians have endured in their own region and asked us to imagine what it would be like if the same events were happen here in Oregon. Or in our case, imagine what if it happened here in Petaluma. Wouldn't hold all those people, but it wouldn't be hard to imagine a small crowd coming in and pushing everybody else out. She goes on and says, as if she read the article, her immediate action was, no way. We wouldn't stand for this. We would fight back, demand justice and reparation for the people of Oregon. <laughs> we can clearly see the injustice in forcibly removing a people who own homes and have established their lives in a community. We would stand up. We would stand up and speak out for the people of Oregon to be restored to their rightful place. When we put ourselves in someone else's shoes, we are able to see things so much more clearly. What happens if we found more and more ways to imagine the what ifs in our society? What if you, perhaps someone who was born in this country, were to put yourselves in the position of an immigrant family who has lived in this country for over a decade and for whom this may be the only home your children have ever known? Perhaps you have tried every possible way to become a legal citizen in a system that doesn't allow for that to happen very easily. How confusing would it be for you to know, to, to now be told you don't belong here and there is no way for you to make it legal? What if you are a Caucasian white mother were to put yourself in a position of a black or brown mother with a young adult son. Can you imagine what it would be like to worry every day if you have done a good enough job in teaching your son how to stay safe? What to do if he's pulled over by the police? And if you are part of one of the many households struggling to make ends meet, how you can balance more than one job while also making sure you put food on the table and find time to support your children and their teachers in their education. 
If we are able to imagine what it would be like for us to live in situations very, very different from anything we have ever experienced, I believe we are more motivated to stand up against abuse <coughs> or violence, oppression and injustice than we see happening to other people. When we hear stories of injustices experienced by others, we may try to rationalize what we hear and explain how there must be something we don't know or understand. But when we imagine those same injustices happening to us, we're able to see and feel how wrong it is and I hope be willing to do something. After all, if we know it's not right for us, why would we believe it was okay for anyone else? That was from Diane Weebly, our conference minister. But the reason I'm sharing it with you is because I believe this is what it means to be guided into truth by the Spirit. A challenge for us to imagine what it means to be the other. The other person, the other race, the other culture, the other who is oppressed, abused, expelled, cajoled, imprisoned, beaten, yes, and even killed, either for what they believe or just for being who they are. Our book study group just finished a very hard read. Over the past several months, we were reading a black man who was born into poverty, who has been an ordained minister for 35 years, and is a professor of sociology at Georgetown, speaking of his experiences. The title is Tears We Cannot Stop, A Sermon to White America. And Dr. Michael Eric Dyson tells of experiences that are hard, and he speaks from pain, and yes, even anger. And it will passionately stir up reactions in you, I guarantee you, because everybody had a reaction <coughs> of one kind or another who read this book in our group. Mm -hmm. yeah. And especially me, I know it stirred up things for me, but what I want to share with you is, is one of the parts of his final chapter. Chapter 6 is entitled Benediction. <coughs> and it's subtitled Responsive, but that's not a word, it's an acronym, because it's our period. E period, S period, P period, O period, S period, I period, D period, E period. Just in case you couldn't spell responsive. <laughs> and I dropped it in. Uh, the chapter is an ask. It's just an ask. He asks first for our reparations. And he admits it is hard to understand and that politically it may be impossible to bring about Individually, though, we can even make a small donation to maybe a scholarship fund, or perhaps making support places that have fair that we support places that have fair hiring and fair pay practices. He asks that we e educate the other letter e educate ourselves around black life and literacy. He says racial literacy is necessary as it is undervalued. And this is something we should try to do and try to do often, not just with black African American community, but with any community around us that we engage in. Because remember, this is the direction people come from. This is the experience people speak from. Their own culture, their own places of existence. The next letter is an S. Which, said, which he says, you must not only read about black life, but you must school your white brothers and sisters, your cousins and uncles, your loved ones and friends, and anyone who will listen to you about the white elephant in the room. White privilege. Now I'm going to come back to white privilege in just a few minutes. But the next letter was P, participation. Go to rallies and, and prayer meetings and protests and, Community meetings, anywhere you can, make a difference. Then he asks us to use the letter S to speak up against injustice. One issue he reminds us with the letter I is the distinction between immigrant experience and black American experience. Though they often overlap, we need to learn that there's a difference, he says. The V in responsive is the visit, he says, the visit to schools, visit to jails, and visit to churches. And of the three, he says, visiting a black church is just good for your soul. <laughs> the best black churches do many of the things religious folk should be doing if they are concerned about the poor and the lost. 
And the final letter, E, is about walking in someone else's shoes. Empathy. All of, he says, quote, all of what I said should lead you to empathy. It sounds simple, but it benefits are so profound. The Holy Spirit shall lead you to truth. Now I'm going to go to another reference. National Geographic has a series by Katie Couric. And she went, recently went to a university where she took the privilege walk. I told you I'd get back to privilege. They only showed a short clip, but I was more interested in it, so I decided to look up the whole thing. And I'm going to share this reflection with you. It's a set of questions. Now, normally it's done, everybody lines up and close your eyes, and you either take a step forward or a step back. We don't even have the room in here for two people to do that, let alone everybody. But what you can do is you can think of your two hands as zero. Pick one side as a positive side as zero. Pick one side as a negative side as zero. So if you take a step forward, you have one. If the next question says you have to take a step back, you're back to zero again. If the next question says you have to take a step back, now you're on the negative side. So if you're a little bit good at math and pay attention, you might be able to get along with this. So here's the privilege walk questions, just so you get an idea where we stand. If your ancestors were forced to come to the U.S. not by choice, take one step back. If your primary ethnic identity is American, take one step forward. If you, ever called, if you were ever called names because of either your race, your class, your ethnicity, your gender, or sexual orientation, take one step back. If there were people who worked for your family as servants, gardeners, nannies, etc., you get to take one step forward. If you were ever ashamed or embarrassed of your clothes, your house, your car, etc., take one step back. If one or both of your parents were white-collar professionals, doctors, lawyers, etc., you get to take one step forward. If you were raised in an area where there was prostitution, drug activity, take one step back. If you ever tried to change your appearance, mannerisms, or behavior to avoid being judged or ridiculed, take one step back. If you studied the culture of your ancestors in elementary school, you get to take one step forward. If you went to school speaking a language other than English, you take one step back. If there were more than 50 books in your house when you grew up, you take one step forward. If you ever had to skip a meal or were hungry because there was not enough money to buy food when you were growing up, you take one step back. If you were taken to art galleries or plays by your parents, you get to take one step forward. If when your parents was unemployed or laid off, not by choice, you take one step back. If you have health insurance, one step forward. If you attended a private school or summer camp, you get to take one step forward. If your family ever had to move because they could not afford the rent, you take one step back. And if you were told that you're beautiful, smart, and capable of, capable by your parents, take one step forward. If you're ever discouraged from academics or jobs because of race, class, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, take one step back. If you were encouraged to attend college by your parents, take one step forward. If you have a disability, take one step backwards. If you're raised in a single parent house, take one step back. If your family owned that house where you grew up, you get to take one step forward. If you saw a member of your race, ethnic group, gender, or sexual orientation portrayed on television in a degrading role, take one step back. If you own a car, take one step forward. If you're ever offered a good job because of your association with friends or family, you get to take one step forward. If you were ever denied employment because of your race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, take one step back. If you were paid less, treated less fairly because of your race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, you take one step back. If you were ever accused of cheating or lying because of your race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, take one step back. 
If you ever inherited money or property, you get to take one step forward. And if you had to rely on public transportation, you take one step back. In the Bay Area, that might be two steps back. <laughs> if you attend private school at any point in your life, you get to take one step forward. If you were ever stopped or questioned by the police because of your race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, take one step back. If you were ever afraid of violence because of your race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, you take one step back. If your parents own their own business, you take one step forward. If you were generally able to avoid places that were dangerous, take one step forward. If you were ever uncomfortable about a joke related to your race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, but felt unsafe to confront the situation, you take one step back. If you use a TTD, a TDD phone system, you take one step back. If you were ever the victim of violence related to your race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation, you take one step back. If your parents did not grow up in the United States, you take one step back. But if your parents attended college, take one step forward. If your parents told you you could be anything that you wanted to be, take one step forward. If you are able to take a step forward, or backward, take two steps forward. There was one more question on here. It says, imagine you are in a relationship. If you can get married in the state of, in this case it would be California, take one step forward. Luckily, you can get married in every state now, so that no longer applies. Even with that no longer applying, I myself still ended up with a negative five. How many people here do this in their head and ended up on the negative side of the scale? That, when you do it in a group, you see where everybody's standing in different places. That's how you see what we call privilege works in this world. It's invisible, but it applies to everybody's life somehow. A little bit positive here, a little bit negative there, and some people very, very negative, and other people very, very positive. Today is the church's birthday. We are called to continue the work of God's truth. The truth that the Spirit is revealing to us, the truth that we are all created in the image of God, and not one of us are living in a just world for all. Not yet. It is through the Spirit we are called to get this work done. So though we may celebrate today, and today is the Sabbath, a day for rest, the other six days of the week, we should be seeking out the opportunity to work for fair wage, for fair pay, to work with sanctuary or the dreamers, or engage in the new poor people's campaign. Seek out a place where we can make a difference just by supporting a place maybe that you know is a little bit greener than everybody else. Supporting a place that you know intentionally hires ethnic minorities to help them find better ways into this 